Some say the pen is mightier than the sword. And maybe they're just a little confused. But whatever the case, there's no need to worry. Because these moves are the bomb. Hi, I'm National Master James Richardson, and welcome to my second video on the four trick variation of the Italian Four Knights. In this video, we'll be looking at 6 bishop b5, a more aggressive variation, pinning our knight on c6. The theme of this lesson will be counterattack through active defense. Throughout the video, I'll be posing problems to you to help motivate the theory along the way. I strongly encourage you to pause the video and think about the solution for yourself at those points. Not only will this be a good training exercise, but also it will help you to incorporate the solutions into your own thought process. Remember that the purpose of training is to help you better make decisions over the board yourself. Many times your opponents will deviate from the main lines and then you'll be on your own. You'll need to weigh multiple options against each other and justify them through concrete variations. General principles will not be enough. This process of analysis can be hard work, but ultimately through practice, it can be very rewarding and raise the level of your game. This was a very fun variation to analyze and it was very tactical. I decided to handle it a little differently from my first video and I include multiple options along the way. This builds a progression that I think puts you in a better position to understand the final solution I give at the very end. I hope that this will give you a better appreciation of the wealth of tactical possibilities at Black's disposal in this line. So let's get to work and prepare our counterattack. Let's go. Let's quickly review the moves leading up to the variation under consideration today. e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, knight c3, knight f6, bishop c4, the Italian four knights. And then we have the fort trick with knight takes. And after the knight takes, we have d5 forking the knight and the bishop. If you want to see a more thorough discussion of the move orders leading up this position, then I welcome you to watch my first video where we covered six bishop takes d5, a common beginner's mistake. But today we're gonna to be looking at a trickier continuation starting with six bishop b5, pinning the knight. And this is actually unsound, but it requires accurate defense to prove that black is better. And it's a very tactical line where we need to play actively in counterattack. So today, we're going to learn how to refute this. So first we take the knight, and then white's idea is to take the pawn on e5. As this is a very tactical line, immediately I'm going to start with a problem here. White is threatening c6. How do we deal with the pin? So pause the video and think for a minute how you would handle this. What did you choose? If you chose bishop d7, this is too passive. White's idea is to take on c6 with the bishop, and after either capture, he's going, white is going to double black's pawns and then exchange off the knight for the bishop and castle kingside. For instance, if bishop takes, knight takes bishop, and then castles. And white has completed his kingside development leaving black with the worst structure with little in return for it. So this is the kind of thing you want to avoid. So let's go back to the position after the pin. Black has two good moves here. And both of them are with queen. The first one we're going to cover is queen to d5. And our main line will be queen to g5, 
which is the most ambitious continuation. So let's start with queen d5. This is a good solid move that's very respectable. It was once played by the second world champion, Emmanuel Lasker. And if you have difficulty remembering the complex variations after queen g5, this is a good simple way to handle this and even play for an advantage. So the queen defends the knight, but it also forks the knight and the bishop. And white has to make a choice here. So there are two moves we'll consider. One is knight takes knight. And here, instead of taking the knight, take the bishop. And now white only has one square to retreat. And here our idea here is we're going to swing to g5, attack g2, exploiting the absence of the light squared bishop. And there's not really a good way to defend this. If white castles, well then we have bishop to h3 threatening mate. And the pawn on e4 covers f3, so the queen's unable to defend. And here, white's only move is to protect with g3, but then we win the exchange. So that's bad for white. Also, if white plays g3, we can also come in with g3, preventing castling, leaving white in a very awkward position. White can protect this pawn with king f1, but this is clearly a concession, as white has lost castling rights and his development is still awkward. What black can do here is attack the knight with queen d5, and if white defends with c3, black can continue development with bishop d7. And there's a nice tactical point here. If white plays queen b3 to try to exchange off the queens, black can actually avoid this trade and play the strong queen h5. And the point here is that if white takes on b7, black can mate with queen to d1. Since white can't do that, black will likely castle queenside, perhaps on the next move, and complete his development with a great position while white's king is stuck on f1, and white's development is still awkward, and he has many light square weaknesses. So this is clearly a bad result for white. So let's go back to queen to d5. Here, white's best move is to take the knight with bishop takes c6 and check. So black takes back, and then white has to save his knight. Um, and there are two approaches we'll look at. One is knight to g4, but let's first look at pawn to d4, protecting the knight. And this actually occurred in a game between Lewis Schmidt and Emmanuel Lasker, New York, 1893. Here, you may, thinking, you may be thinking about taking the pawn on passant. That's a decent move. I thought that was the best move at first. Um, with the point here is that if white saves his knight, then black can take the pawn and he's completely winning. Okay, with the king side ruined. But I'll mention that white has a stronger move after pawn takes. He can save his knight by castling. Okay. And it'd be a blunder to take the knight because it runs into a pin. So black should really consider getting castled himself and just give the pawn back. When I think the position is not that far from equal, actually. So um, I think black can do better than this. And I recommend the move that Lasker played. So after pawn to d4, instead of taking, let's play bishop a6. And this stops castling. And here, OK, white can play c3, protecting the pawn. And after bishop d6, we see one of the ideas. White can play queen to b3, 
offering a trade to queens. And here, well, I don't think black can really avoid it. And what Lasker played was castles. And then after the trade, white played knight d7, and the knight was able to get to c5. And I think black was better there, um, but maybe an improvement is to play f6 with the trade coming and then after the knight retreats, um, you maybe get a slightly better version of the ending that last curve played. Or I think I think black here has a slight, if not clear, advantage. So this is favorable for black. So let's go back. Let's see. So after this trade on C6. White can also play here to g4, knight g4, and one of the ideas is that after queen g5, the knight can come back to defend. Um, so I recommend queen to e6, keeping the queen more centralized, attacking the knight with the battery of the bishop and the queen. And after the knight retreats, we can continue developing with bishop d6. Um, but another good approach that immediately presses white is to play f5. And white has to take this move very seriously because if he just castles here, for instance, can complete, trying to complete his development, then he loses to f4. And if you look, the knight is trapped. He can't go to g4 or c4. And he's just kind of stuck. Um, you see the, where this battery comes into play. And another point is if he plays d3, this doesn't work out so well either. Again, black can play f4, it has this discovery. So that's clearly bad. And white's best here, I think, is to play queen to e2. And here, for black, I would just recommend completing your development with bishop d6. And if white goes for the trade of queens, just continue developing. Allow the trade in castle. And if he trades, then you get a great game. Okay, this time, okay, you're fully developed. You've got both your bishops out. You've castled, connected your rooks. You have the space. You're pressing white. And white's development is rather poor. So this more than compensates with, for the double isolated pawns. And in fact, um, one idea here for white might be to play b3 to give a square for the knight, um, so that after f4 he can play knight c4. But uh, one idea for black here is just to transform his advantage by taking the knight and then taking the open file with a very active game. Okay, and I think black has almost a clear advantage here. Um, let's go back. So um, after queen e2 uh, and then bishop d6, queen c4, and castles, um, you might be wondering about queen takes c6. What do you do if white gets greedy here? But there's a surprisingly strong counter to this. Uh, black doesn't have to directly defend the rook. He can simply play f4, and white falls under a tremendous attack. Um, taking the rook just makes things worse because after the after white takes the rook, we take on e3, and everything's pointed towards the king. And either capture this pawn is going to be bad. He takes with the f pawn, queen come to f5, and the queen's ready to come into f2, okay? And the rook can't come to f1, okay? And if white takes with the other pawn, well then, we can claim this diagonal with bishop a6 and attack the queen by discovery. And, uh, so, excuse me, the queen was on e6. And 
after if white tries to defend against queen c4 to make the king, then black has a discovery with bishop b4 check winning the queen. So this is clearly a disaster. And after f4, the strong f4, if white plays um, knight d5, this doesn't work out well either because black connects the rooks with bishop d7 and gets very strong counterplay for these pawns. White can take on c7, but black can just take it. And then black's ready to attack the queen once more. And here, if white takes another pawn, you can just come into c2. And we are fully mobilized to attack the king while it's in the center. And white has serious problems. <coughs> if white castles here, we can just continue the attack with f3. And this is very strong. And the king's going to be open to a decisive attack. Uh, g3 would simply fail to queen h3 mating. So this is just an outright disaster if white becomes too ambitious. So that's our coverage of queen d5. And next we'll be looking at queen to g5 on the seventh move. Now we'll look at the more ambitious move, queen to g5. And this is a move that is again a fork with the knight and the pawn g2. And there's also an x-ray on the bishop. One of the points of this move is that if white takes the knight on c6, then we can take the bishop on b5. And if you recall, this actually transposed to the line we looked at with queen d5, where white took the knight. And recall that the only retreat square is knight d4, and then we play queen g5 as we looked at earlier. So here, the best move for white is d4, protecting the knight and discovering attack on the queen. So here, we can't take this on passant for sure, because our queen's under attack. We need to take on g2 and we ruin white's king side. And white needs to save his rook with rook to f1. So here will be our second problem. How do we handle the pin now? So pause the video and think about what you would do here as black. Okay, so what did you choose? I hope you didn't choose bishop d7. This is just a blunder. Um, remember, we need to counterattack actively here. And this just fails to knight x d7. And after the king takes, white just wins a piece. So that's something to be avoided. Here, we'll look at three moves that I think are decent. And we'll look at the variations progressively building up to the the most ambitious move. So the first move we'll look at is bishop to h3. This is one of the major ideas for black. And we'll also look at a6, another good idea. And lastly, the most ambitious with bishop to d6. So let's start with bishop h3. So bishop h3 forms a battery against the rook on f1. At the moment, the bishop's protecting the knight. So this can help keep white tied down to the defense as a guard against the pin here. Now white can take the knight. This is probably his best move. And after black takes back, yes, white does get bishop c6 with check. But after black moves the king, again, we don't want to defend passively. That would just lose the rook and we lose our attack. So after we move the king, 
And if white takes the rook now, white falls under a tremendous attack. So that doesn't work for white. And white needs to defend with queen to e2. This gives black time to defend his rook with rook to b8. And now white's best move is just to take the pawn on e4, forcing black to win the exchange and trade off the queens with queen takes f1. And here after the trade, and white takes, we have a position where black has won the exchange at the cost of a pawn. And I think black is slightly better here, although there's still a lot of work to be done. Okay, so let's now look at a more ambitious continuation for black. Black can actually do better. So, All right, so here, after rook f1, the other move to consider is a6. And this is a more ambitious continuation. The idea here is, or one of the ideas is that if white moves off the diagonal with bishop a4, now bishop to h3 becomes stronger. And White needs to defend now with the queen on e2. Here, black can trade off the pieces as before, but he has some nice resources with b5 that save the material he lost in the other variation. For instance, if the king takes after b5, if, knight, if he takes the knight, we take the bishop, okay, and um, if you check, we're even a pawn up, despite these ugly pawns over here, along with the exchange. And the same holds if he retreats the bishop, we can trade off the knights. And again, we're up a pawn in the exchange with a completely winning position. So this does not work out well for white. A better move for black to try here after a6 is to take on c6 with check. And after black takes, white's best move here is to play queen to h5. And white is threatening a mate in two. He's threatening queen takes f7, followed by knight takes c6 with mate. Black has two good possibilities here, in fact. The most obvious is to play g6, guarding against the mate and attacking the queen. And white's idea here to defend is queen to g5, forcing a trade of queens. Here black can take, and after the trade, black should just develop, cover his weakness, and white can take on c6, but Although material is equal, black is the bishop pair, and this is definitely an advantage. Uh, a sample continuation here is bishop d7, chasing the knight. If the knight go back, goes back to b4, um, we just need to be a little careful here about taking this pawn, because then white can castle queenside and play knight d5 with some counterplay, uh, a better continuation is simply just to play bishop e6, covering d5, um, preparing our development. And if he defends the pawn, we can chase the knight back now and connect our rooks with king to d7. I think we have almost a clear advantage here because um, we have the bishop pair and we have very nice development. Uh, we're, we're ready to attack on the semi-open b-file with one of the rooks and 
Another thing to observe is that white has a lot of light square bishops, so I think black is in an excellent position to play for a win here. So that's a good safe continuation to get the advantage. Now let's look at a different possibility going back. Okay. So let's quickly go back to the position after a6. So here, white's best move was to take with check, play queen h5, and now black doesn't have to play g6. He can play a surprising move. He can play bishop h3, this idea we saw earlier. And although white gets queen to takes f7 with check, and also knight c6, now black's not getting mated because he has a square on c8. And White's attack has run out while white has to defend on f1 now. And so the best white has here is just to come back and defend with queen to c4. And while white's tied to the defense of the rook on f1, he can just continue developing with bishop d6. And at the moment that white is ready to castle queenside, black can cash in, take the exchange, and after the queen trade, pick off the pawn on h2, and he's up in exchange with the clear advantage. So this is also quite a good way to play, and I can recommend this as well. So there's just one last thing I want to mention about this variation after a6. Let's see here, here. After a6, I can also try a tricky move. He can play queen to h5 immediately. And there are a couple ways of handling this. Um, probably the most obvious move here is to play g6 which would in fact transpose the variation we looked at earlier after a bishop takes with check and queen g5 with the trade of queens. And we saw that was advantageous to black, but uh, black can even play more ambitiously for the win and just call white's bluff and take the bishop on b5, allowing queen takes f7. And after king d8, White has some problems continuing the attack. He can try bishop f4, threatening knight takes c6, followed by bishop c7 mate, but black has a simple way to defend with bishop to d6. And black's up a piece, um, and although he had to move the king, uh, his development is not too compromised. Uh, for instance, he's ready to play rook to f8. Um, so this is just winning for black. So there's no need to fear that. So next, we're going to be looking at the main line of queen g5, bishop to d6 on the ninth move. Let's quickly review the moves leading up to our main line. e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6. So the Italian four knights, the fort trick, and then the pin. We take, and after taking, we have the ambitious queen to g5. In Victor Bulligan's book, Bulligan's Black Weapons, he calls this Dixon's counterattack. And white defends with d4, and black takes. After the rook moves, we're going to look at nine bishop to d6 now. So we saw bishop h3 and a6, and this is the most ambitious move and will be our main line. After white takes on c6, we have another problem. So this will be our third problem. How does black handle the situation now? So pause the video and think where you'd move as black.
What did you choose? I think there are two good moves here. One is a6, and the other is bishop d7. Bishop d7 is my main recommendation, and we'll be following a line recommended by Bulligan. But I wanted to show some ideas with a6. And this also came up earlier in a different form. Um, so a6 attacks the bishop, and white's best is to retreat. Knight a7 check doesn't work so well because although white will get the light square bishop, black is ready to castle kingside. And if white's too greedy, say a move like queen takes b5, then black can just open the center. And white has serious problems now. So this is a failure for white. So after a6, better for white is bishop to a4. And again, there's a divide. Black can play bishop d7 here, as on the move earlier, and this is also good, though I won't go into detail about it. The point of bishop d7 is that we have this pin on the knight. If the knight moves, we can take the bishop. Um, so my main variation here will be castles, and this is a top engine move. So I wanted to cover this because there's an interesting tactic involved here, but you have to be prepared for it if you're going to play this line, and it's not so obvious. And this will lead to our fourth and final problem. What do you do after white retreats the knight to e5? Is white going to stay up a piece here? Black has a very strong continuation here, though. And this is the full tactical justification for castles. Okay, so pause the video and think what you do here. Okay, the strongest move is bishop takes knight. After the capture, instead of playing bishop h3, black's idea is to play bishop to g4, attacking the queen. And this is a very powerful idea that, be, that, that is introduced once the rooks are connected. Here, if white moves the king, black can play the rook to d8. And if the queen moves, it's checkmate on d1. So white can allow that, and he has to play f3. But here our idea is to take the pawn, and we introduce the powerful threat of f2 check. The best move for white is queen d2. If he blocks with a rook, that just loses, because we have queen g1. If the king moves, we he loses the rook. And if he blocks with a rook, we get f2 winning the queen. And we're ready to take back with promotion of the queen if he takes on g1. So this is a clear win. Oh, sorry. After, after here, king d2, we're clearly winning. And a queen. So let's go back. So white needs to play queen to d2. And if you didn't see this far, see if you can find the win now. The idea here is f2 check, sacrificing the pawn. And after either capture, now we can fork the king and the bishop with check. After white blocks, we take on a4. Now, if you calculate this, I hope you looked at me further because there there's still things to check. There's rook f4, forking the queen and bishop, but black can save himself, queen to d7. And this may look completely winning at first sight, but white still has some defensive resources. Um, yes, 
White's king's in the center and black's up a clear pawn, but white can force the trade of queens with queen d4. So we can trade. And I think a good approach for black here is to play h5 and be ready to take um, the d file. Um, with an excellent game, although this is bishops of offset color, because the rooks are still on the board, I think um, black has good opportunities to play for a win here. Uh, since with the rooks on, bishops of opposite color can become sharper and favor the attacker, the side with the initiative. So this is a good approach, but let's go to our main line now with bishop to d7. So... We have okay. So after a bishop takes, knight takes c six, bishop d six, knight takes c six. Um, let's look instead of a six now. Let's look at bishop d7. Now, here the idea is that, okay, we're pinning the knight, as I mentioned before, and d4 is taking a square away from the knight where it would like to go to save his bishop. So the best that white has is to take on a7 to protect the bishop, but we have a nice finesse. Okay, instead of taking the knight right away, we can play c6, attacking the bishop, and white can take a pawn with knight takes e6, but we can just take back with the pawn. We keep our light spread bishops on the board with tempo, and white has to retreat, and we're ready to castle, and we're fully mobilized. So this is a great result with white's king just stuck in the center. And we, I'll show a few sample variations to show how black can increase his advantage. Um, white can try to continue development with bishop e3. And here, we can use the same idea we saw earlier. We can play bishop to g4. And white has an unpleasant decision. Okay, he can either move his queen or block with the bishop. But if he blocks with the bishop, black can go to e6 and take an active position. And here, it's very hard for white to make constructive moves. Uh, just to show you how things could go wrong. If white tries to play a move like c4, black can uh, start his attack with f5, um, threatening f4. And if white tries to block it, he's opening himself up even more, and black can just take on passant. If white takes with the bishop, well then, Black can even shift over the queen side with the weakness that c4 created. And white's just completely lost here. So that gives black an active stance. If white blocks, and if the queen moves, the bishop's preventing queenside castling. And here black can just take the pawn now. We got a good score for the bishop with tempo. And white can focus on maybe trying to create some play with a4 to push his past pawn. But it's going to be hard for him to make much progress with both of black's rooks on the board. And black has ways to create threats of his own on the opposite side. Um, Black can win the exchange now, and uh, white can keep pushing. Uh, one thing, well, one thing I want to mention here. Um, sometimes white might try to trade the queens to ease the pressure. Maybe even stronger than going after the exchange, because this, this isn't going anywhere. You could play uh, rook fb8, putting pressure on the queen side by attacking b2. And it's hard for white to deal with this. 
Um, for instance, if, if white blocks with the bishop, instead of going for the, the rook right away, we can keep him bottled up and play bishop to f3, and we still reserve the possibility of bishop g2 maybe, but it's very hard for white to make a constructive move here. If he pushes his a pawn, he gets caught with the fork winning the pawn. Um, he can't move his c pawn, of course, because the bishop. Um, he can't castle queen side. Um, he can't even make room for his queen, for his king, uh, to connect his rooks because this just caught gets caught in a pin. So, um, and trying to break in the center doesn't work out well either because after he takes, black can easily defend, and now there's an open d file, and white is poorly coordinated. And this will work in black's favor. It's not too difficult for him to get a rook on the d file, and um, maybe even use this bishop as well. Note that it's protected. So this is a, a very bad result for white. Um, another thing, let's see, after a4, um, rook fb8, uh, probably better for white is to play c3, but uh, now we can go to the exchange, and if white tries to trade the queens here, then his b pawn drops. So um, now white can push, like on the queen side, but we can take the exchange. And uh, we have this situation, four versus one on both sides with the pawns. But this clearly favors black. He's up the exchange, but also uh, better coordinated. And um, here, uh, black can consider pushing himself, really. Um, we, get, we can have a situation where both sides are pushing. Okay. But once black comes down to h3, things start to get really serious. Um, for instance, queen g1 might be a possibility preparing h2. Um, so here, uh, I think white needs to castle queenside to defend himself. Um, but still, black can continue to make progress slowly. Uh, he could bring the queen to h1 to keep this pawn protected. And it's difficult for white to make use of the discoveries. Um, he could, uh, I mean, he could go to b5, but if he takes this pawn, he loses the a6 pawn, and that doesn't work out so well. Um, he could go to, to e2, but the queen has a retreat square, and there's no perpetuals. The queen easily escapes, and black can continue to regroup and prepare to slowly gain ground, while white's at a bit of a dead end here. And it's hard for him to make progress, once again, because his king is so open. And again, black's up the exchange. So black is winning. And one of the things I like about this variation, and the reason it's my main variation, is white doesn't have a good out to simplify things. And it's hard for him to make constructive moves while black gets the initiative deep in the middle game. And one wrong step and white is just completely lost. So I think this is a total bust of the variation, and I highly recommend it. And I think it's, the ideas are fairly simple once you get the, the sense of the tempo moves, that finesse with c6. Uh, the moves are very natural. Um, so that's the end of our coverage of the pin variation with six bishop b5, and next we'll be looking at the main line with six bishop d3. And there are gonna be some exciting tactics there. So see you next time.